So far, we have seen how the variance is partitioned in between subject and ova. Now, let's uh, take a look at how variances are partitioned in one way within subject design. So what we have here is how variances are partitioned in one way between subject and ova. And from this, the error term here, right, the within, um, that is called within group variability um, called SSW in one way within subject NOVA. And this within subject uh, within, uh, within group variability is further partitioned into subject variability and error term. Now this error term is used as SSR in calculating the F ratio against SSM, which is the model sum of the square. So in um, one way within subject ANOVA, uh, the total variance and the model sum of the square uh, is actually the same, but you know this error term is further partitioned to take away the subject variability because um, you know, in each condition, um, the subject is related or they're the same individuals. So you want to take away um, the, the extra variability coming from uh, the subjects. So um, essentially, you, you, you will have a very small, a smaller, smaller error term as opposed to the one way between subject and over. So um, here is a kind of hypothetical study um, where you want to test the efficacy of a diapil in reducing the weight over 12 months. Now uh, we have five volunteers, N equals five, um, and they are recruited and their weight was measured a uh, three time period. Uh, first month, after six months, and 12 months. So we're going to use exactly the same fictitious data, but uh, we're going to treat this data as if they are uh, collected within subjects. So in this case, it is not different uh, groups or different condition control. So before it was control, placebo, and drug condition. Um, whereas in this scenario, um, there's only a real drug, um, and then their weights were measured in three different time periods, first month, six month, and 12 month to see the effect of the drug, um, as a function of a time, basically. So um, here is uh, our set of hypotheses. So the null is that there will be no difference in uh, the weight loss uh, across all this time period. But the alternative is that there will be a, a difference, at least in one of the groups, um, compared to the other groups. So we have this same table with the same data. But in this case, um, you know, the columns of data are measured within subjects. So they are actually, so whatever data on a row is coming from the same individual, right? So um, their weight loss is measured after one month of treatment and after six months and after 12 months for this subject. And so given the data, let's just calculate the um, total sum of the square, which, which should be the same, but I'll calculate the SST in a bit different uh, way from what I did previously for the between subject, but it'll provide the same result. So I calculate the mean of each subject um, this way, not this way this time. And 
this has to do with the uh, calculation of SSS later on too. So um, I'm just uh, doing this to show you um, how we calculate the uh, mean of each subject. So we calculate the mean of subject um, this way instead of uh, calculating the group means this way. So if uh, to do so, you have to first cal calculate the sum of the row and you can take the mean of each row by dividing that sum by four, uh, three, sorry, right? Sum, so that divided by three becomes five and so on. So you have the mean here. And then the grand mean is just mean of these means. So you just add them all up and divide it by five, you get 3.47, which is the same grand mean we had before. Now, um, the total sum of the square is basically you calculate the deviance between each datum and the grand mean. Square this deviance and add them all up and you get uh, the total sum of the square 43.74 which is the um, you know, same as before now SSW so that was actually the SSR in the between subject design um, but um, the steps to calculate this term is the same you basically subtract the group mean from the data of that group. So that is the deviance and deviance squared. You add them all up and you get um, 23.6. Again, this should be the same as before. Now what's different in um, within subject design uh, is that, you know, this SS WSSR is further partitioned into SSS and error term. Now, the SSS, um, first you have to replace all the data with a uh, row mean. So, this, so for each subject, we calculated the, um, the mean, right? And so to calculate the SSS, you first replace this mean with all the um, different data uh, at different times, right? So this um, person's uh, data uh, are all replaced with the mean of five and so on, 2.67, 3.33. And you subtract each cell from the grand mean like we did to calculate the uh, models of the squares in the between subject ANOVA. And that is squared. And then um, that is the uh, SSS, if you add all these uh, square deviants. Um, so the SSS here is 17.7. .7. Now that we have all the terms, we can calculate the uh, mean squares. So here we have um, total sum of the square and split into SSW and model sum of the square. And you know this this is just basically the same as the between subject ANOVA. But now this SSW term is further split into SSS and SSR. And so that's where the difference is coming from compared to the between subject um, ANOVA. So we're going to use this term in calculating the F ratio in within subject ANOVA. And so this is our term and this is the model sum of the square. So obviously we're going to have larger F ratio given the same uh, data basically. So here's the uh, model mean square, <clears throat> which you divide um, SSM by the model degrees of freedom. So that is again the same as between subject and 10.05. And the residual mean square here is 
and SSR, the 5.9 divided by the residual degrees of freedom. So that's different. And also the residual degrees of freedom for within subject design is also different. So that is I minus one. So number of groups minus one, which is two. And then J minus one, the number of subject minus one. So we multiply them together. So that's two times four and it's a 0.74 right so now <clears throat> we have um both mean squares now we're going to just take the ratio between the two then we're going to get 13.6 and again we can calculate the uh, critical statistics using jamovi so uh, let's do that okay so here is our jamovi again to calculate the area under the curve or to calculate the critical statistics, you need this module called distraction. And from this distraction, you need F distribution. <clears throat> okay, so um, now we have different degrees of freedom for the current F distribution. So we have two. Uh, for the uh, model degrees of freedom and eight for the uh, error degrees of freedom. So first, uh, let's calculate the um, the critical statistics where it sits at 95th percentile. So that is 4.459. So it's about 4.46. That is the critical statistics. Um, you know beyond which the area under the curve becomes 0.05. In fact, we can calculate the p-value of our um, breadth observed F statistics we just calculated. So if we just load this and tick this to find out um, the p-value of our statistics, which was 13.6. And we need to tick this, so the likelihood, the probability that uh, that um, we will see this statistics or more extreme, right, larger than this, uh, is this. So um, let's see. So the probability is 0 0.003, right? So um, it is much smaller than alpha 0.05. That means we have a significant um, F, right? So that's what it means. So now we come back to the slide. And as we can see, our, um, you know, uh, observe the statistics the 13.6 is much greater than the critical statistic 4.46 so that already um you know tells us that the statistics is significant but if we look at the distribution right so this is the f distribution uh with the degrees, th these degrees of freedom two and eight and the critical statistics was 4.46 um, so that's that's f crit 2.8 no 4.46 sorry um, and the our data is somewhere here that's 13.6. That's F absurd. Right, so the P value is this. This blue region. Whereas no, that is alpha, sorry. So that is alpha and um, 0.05. And the p value is this area. 
So obviously, and p-value is 0 0.003, right? So um, p-value is much smaller than alpha 0.05, right? So we know that we reject the null of no difference. So meaning that at least one of the means uh, will be different. And also, the, in this case, f observed is greater than f create right and from this also we can know that we know that um our f statistics is statistically significant this way right so now we can make a decision and so uh, the decision rule is still the same right? if not significant then you fail to check the null of no difference say and then, then you stop and report the results saying that uh, there is no effect of the diet pill um, regardless of uh, how much you um, take the pill right at least over a month it is not really effective and um, however um, because it was significant now we need to proceed with the post hoc analysis to identify uh, where the difference is coming from so again because we do not know you know where this difference is coming from uh, we need to run the post hoc test so here are the assumptions and recommendations um, behind the uh, within subject um, so running running the um, within subject ANOVA one way within subject ANOVA and normality um, you know this is always included and somehow Jamovi doesn't really offer how to test uh, normality for the within subject design um, so the only option you can have is the um, the QQ plot, the quantile, quantile plot. So basically you need to eyeball to determine if your data are normally distributed or not. Um, but in many cases, what's more important assumption? Uh, the, the more important assumption is this equality of various in all pairwise differences, what is known as a sphericity. Okay, so it is almost um, replace uh, well, not replaced, but it is, uh, you know, uh, considered much more important than normality somehow in within subject design. So, um, you need to test this as sphericity, right? Because um, within subject ANOVA is quite sensitive to the violation of sphericity. So, this is a test with the Moglis, Moglis W test of sphericity. Again, if the p-value from Moklis test is less than 0.05, then you have a problem with um, the sphericity. In that case, there are three corrections um, provided in Jamovi or other software such as SPSS, Hunenfeld, Greenhouse Geyser, and Lower Bound. And you cannot just ignore Lower Bound because this is just the most conservative um, correction. So, um, I recommend that you use the uh, greenhouse and geyser uh, correction to report the um, the within subject effect. Um, so there's also again non-parametric alternative to within subject uh, within subject ANOVA one way, which is a Friedman. So <clears throat> again the idea is the same um, all these non-parametric um, tests will convert the raw data into the rank the ordinal data and then compare if uh, two or more distributions are coming from the same population that's um, basically what all these tests um, is looking after so once you decided to run this Friedman test then you also need to include descriptive statistics again because this is non-parametric 
uh, medians and IQR uh, should be reported. And the main result is a Q statistics. So the Friedman's test is a Q statistics. And also, again, you need to run the post hoc analysis um, when you have significant Q statistics. And for um, Friedman's, it offers Durbin Canover test as a post hoc analysis. Okay, so that was pretty much everything about one-way analysis of variance. Um, so, you know, it can go like two-way, three ways, and um, uh, can get you know quite complicated, but it is just beyond the scope of this module. And in fact, I, I know myself, uh, there's typically a separate module uh, in and of itself. So, but um, I think it's enough to just um, um, know to how to run in a one-way uh, analysis of variance. So, um, as a summary, um, here is kind of a, a roadmap to um, the analysis of ANOVA, and so step-by-step -step procedure, how to run one-way between subject ANOVA and within subject ANOVA in the next slide. So like everything else, the first thing you need to do is to run the exploratory data analysis. Right? And then while you're doing that, you also need to check the assumption, the respective assumption. I mean, this is uh, assuming um, that you know uh, this is, you're going to run the one way between subject ANOVA, right? So you have to actually look at the relationship between the groups, if they are related or not, to decide <clears throat> if you want to run between subject or within subject uh, ANOVA. So for the between subject, you need to check two assumptions, normality and equality of variance. So when both assumptions are met, then you can run uh, the usual between subject ANOVA if and then if this ANOVA uh, come out to be significant then you have to run the post hoc analysis right but in case <coughs> excuse me oh the normality uh, was violated then you need to run Crisco Wallace which is non-parametric alternative to um, parametric ANOVA, and once you have a significant crystal Wallace result, then again, you need to run the post hoc analysis. In case the equality of uh, variances assumption is violated, then you can run Welch's F, and once the Welch's F is significant, then get, again, you need to run the post hoc analysis. Um, and for the within, uh, the first step is the same uh, EDA, and you need to check the assumption. So for within subject, um, one way ANOVA, you, again, there are two assumptions, normality and sphericity. And sphericity is much more important, but, you know, if these two assumptions are met, statistically speaking, then you can run the... Um, the typical within subject ANOVA F, and when this was significant, then you can run the post hoc analysis to find out where the difference is coming from. If the normality is violated, then you run Friedman, uh, which is the non parametric alternative to within subject F, and when this was significant, then you have to run post hoc. When the sphericity is violated, then you choose the greenhouse geyser correction. And when this was significant, then you run post hoc analysis again. So um, this is it. And, and thank you for listening.